Hello, I am Dr Jonathan Wiley, lead author of the European Resuscitation Council guidelines for the resuscitation and support of transition of babies at birth. I'm going to talk about the main changes to those guidelines. The changes are based on the interpretation of scientific evidence produced by the International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation and by incorporating advice from experts, providers, instructors and educators to ensure the most effective delivery of support and resuscitation to babies at birth. In summary, the main changes are as follows. Firstly, the title for these guidelines has been changed. Resuscitation and support of transition of babies at birth recognises the unique situation of the baby at birth, which only rarely requires resuscitation and more often needs medical help during the process of postnatal transition. Cord clamping. For uncompromised babies, a delay in cord clamping of at least one minute from the complete delivery of the infant is now recommended for both term and preterm babies. Temperature. The temperature of newly born, non-asphyxiated infants should be maintained between 36.5 and 37.5 degrees centigrade after birth. It should be recorded as a predictor of outcome as well as a quality indicator. This may not appear new, but the increased emphasis is due to the strong association between hypothermia and both mortality and morbidity at all gestations and in all settings. At less than 32 weeks gestation, a combination of interventions may be required to maintain temperature between 36.5 and 37.5 degrees centigrade. For every degree below 36.5 degrees centigrade, the risk of mortality increases by at least 28%, so keep newborn infants warm. Assessment of heart rate. An ECG can now be used to provide a rapid and accurate estimation of heart rate in babies requiring resuscitation at birth. This is not a strong recommendation, but may herald the increased use of ECG in the delivery room in the future. Meconium. Tracheal intubation should not be routine in the presence of meconium and should only be performed for suspected tracheal obstruction. This is not a great change for the ERC guidelines, but may still be a change in terms of its implementation across Europe. The emphasis should be on initiating ventilation within the first minute of life in non-breathing or ineffectively breathing infants, and this should not be delayed. Air oxygen. Ventilatory support of term infants should start with air as previously. For preterm infants, either air or a low concentration of oxygen up to 30% should be used. This represents a slight change to previous guidelines, which started with air for support of preterm infants. The use of oxygen should still be guided by oximetry. CPAP. The initial respiratory support of spontaneously breathing preterm infants with respiratory distress may be provided by CPAP rather than intubation. Compressions. If needed, the ratio remains three compressions to one ventilation, which is synchronised however that ventilation is delivered. And of course, this is not a change. However, the heart rate will usually increase within 30 seconds of effective inflation breaths and ventilation. It is therefore logical to start compressions if the heart rate remains less than 60 per minute after this period. This hopefully clarifies previous confusion. It means that lung expansion and ventilation is established. There is more opportunity for the heart rate to respond, which usually occurs within 30 seconds of effective ventilation, and avoids compromise of ventilation by compressions.